What happens when you have something that would fit on this table and it will run your house? Pulling energy from the quantum vacuum or the zero point energy field. You don't need utilities. J.P. Morgan famously was reported to have said to Nikola Tesla when he had a car that had a little antenna on it that was running around where the batteries were charging it themselves. J.P. Morgan said, if we can't put a meter on it, we don't want it. Dr. Putoff, he does zero point energy research. He's worked for every three letter agency. Told me personally that he knew we already had these technologies, but that if he were to bring them forward, he would be killed along with his family and children. 1927, there were two billion people in the world. Now there's seven. So of those two billion people, there were very few people living with cars and electricity in their homes and et cetera and so on. Now you have seven billion people and billions more people living on that system, which has become entrenched, bureaucratically built into our funding mechanisms from the state, local, federal level of support and also where there are a lot of very powerful stakeholders. And so from a rational point of view, you'd say, well, these technologies would get us off of oil, gas, nuclear power, no more Fukushima's. But from the point of view of people who are looking at the national security equation from a macroeconomic stability point of view, this is their worst nightmare. 99.9% .9 of the, pup, the people on planet Earth would benefit from this. There is a very, very, it's not the 1%, it's the 0.0000001% who would not benefit from this because they are the ones sitting atop the petrodollar system, the macroeconomic order, and particularly the fact that it is run and everything we're using is run on a metered linear energy source, even solar and wind. If you begin to talk about the phenomena of new energy, free energy, anti-gravity, UFOs, you're stepping into an area that is the most sensitive compartmented intelligence in the history of the United States. First, I want to give you sort of the big picture. And the big picture is that we haven't needed fossil fuels since about 100 years ago. This building was built in 1913, certainly by then, uh, Tesla, Faraday, Maxwell, particularly the maxwell quartinian equations that were chopped off and changed, as you may well know, some of you who are engineers, uh, has resulted in us having a energy sector that requires us to burn something or heat something up to create steam to get us electricity or to run our cars. Uh, however, a hundred years of really advanced physics which weren't that well understood 100 years ago in terms of very high voltage systems at certain resonant high hertz, they call it, cycles per second, would result in this excess power. And it was observed by Faraday, and it was observed by Tesla, and it was observed by many others, and said, where is this coming from? Uh, Professor Dirac, D-I-R-A-C, said, well, he called it the Dirac C. And of course, Tesla called it the ocean of infinite energy. And it's been called various things. The modern term is the zero point energy field. If you create this kind of vector into the zero point energy field and you create a certain uh, counter rotating vortex, let's call it, which is, is almost a, a Sufi like phenomenon, you get what's called lift. And you get a, a phenomenon uh, that's known as uh, electromagnetogravitics. Now, the pop culture would call it anti-gravity, which is really not correct. What you're really doing when you see a UFO moving and it's going straight up 10,000 miles per hour against gravity is that it's actually in a space-time bubble. It's creating its own environment, shall we say. So there's no restrictions to normal aerodynamic formula. And so the thing can lift and go straight up at those velocities. And if it goes through a certain, another level, the, the entire object, the mass of the entire object can become massless.
And that's when you enter into what's called the trans-dimensional physics, when something moves from one dimension to another or transverses one dimension to another. By definition, all interstellar vehicles are trans-dimensional. Let me repeat that. If it's interstellar, it is trans-dimensional. It is not getting here at a subluminal or below the speed of light velocity. This is the key thing that people have to understand uh, and began to be studied. Now, in the early days, let's go back to the time of Tesla. They were observing with usually DC power systems, direct current as opposed to alternating current, which we use in our homes, which Nikola Tesla invented or came up with, that would have this effect where a certain amount of energy would go into a system, more would come out. It wasn't really accepted until uh, Dr. Casimir, a physicist named Casimir, and the Casimir effect, where this was published in mainstream physics journals, by the way, proved that there was this zero-point energy field, that there was this energy that was left even after you cooled down all the atoms and all the activity in the universe down to absolute zero, which is a specific temperature. And there's still this energy there. And that zero-point energy field, as it turns out, is embedded everywhere in space, not outer space, here in this room. So that every cubic centimeter of space in this room, for example, uh, has enough power to run at least the United States for a day, a cubic centimeter. So it's an enormous field of energy. So running our planet on this energy field would be like taking a thimble out of the Great Lakes or something of water. It, it, it's a trivia, it's a, it's a rounding error. Uh, however, as J.P. Morgan famously was reported to have said to Nikola Tesla when he had a car that had a little antenna on it that was running around where the batteries were charging it themselves. J.P. Morgan said, if we can't put a meter on it, we don't want it. Big bankers. Now, 100 years ago or 90 years ago, to today, nothing's really changed in terms of the geopolitical, financial, macroeconomic exigencies. And that's the huge problem. Is there a technical challenge? Yes. And we'll get into how we can, we can mount a, a sort of effort together to come up with a, a modern day version of, of what Tesla had. But the geopolitical macroeconomic policy issue is the big problem. And it isn't just because there are a few bankers and kleptocrats that are misanthropic sociopaths, although some of them are. Um, it's because there are a lot of stakeholders who don't want to have to deal with the change. Even if you don't accept that in your paradigm, the inhumanity of keeping these sciences and technologies away from the public and the poverty that it engenders. Because I was talking to an industrialist from India and he was telling me it would take trillions of dollars to properly electrify the subcontinent so that people have the, the energy they need using the today's conventional systems, even solar, even wind, even coal. And, you know, we're looking, facing a situation now that every year or two there's a thousand new coal-fired burning uh, power plants being put online in India, China, and elsewhere, mostly without any scrubbers. So in the Pacific Northwest and other places, you have a huge amount of the pollution that's in the West Coast is coming from Asia because there's no scrubbers in those coal and you look at the air in, in Beijing and Shanghai and other cities, it's, it's, it's not breathable. Then you go to the oceans, where you have the Fukushima reactor releasing all this radioactive material, and huge parts of the oceans, because there's all the CO2 going into the oceans, are beginning to die because of the acidity and alkaline levels being upset. So there are all these big macro geophysical effects while we're trying to maintain the current macroeconomic order. Big problem, huge mistake. But who's going to fix it? This, this is really the crux of the problem. Now many people have asked me, given the folks I've met with over the years, why doesn't someone do that? But see, everyone says that. My wife and I this week were just up in New York meeting with the head of a foundation 
And the question came up frequently with people there, all of whom were incredibly wealthy. Well, why doesn't Bill Gates do it? Or why doesn't the president? It's always, why doesn't someone else? Of course, if you go to the president, he'll say, <laughs> no way, Jose. And if you go to billionaire X and billionaire Y and billionaire Z, many of whom I've met with, they'll go, you know, one of them once said to me, we all want to be first to be second. <laughs> Great expression, you hear it a lot in business, when it's a very controversial science, no one wants to be the first to stick their neck out. So this becomes then a leadership issue, which is what I've tried to provide some clarity to in my own humble way, being not a significantly wealthy or powerful person at all, but knowing what I know, try to share it with the public and try to create a momentum towards disclosure, not only of the fact that we're not alone in the universe, but that the secret behind these UFO propulsion systems and, and energy systems would give us an entirely new planet, beautiful. But there are stakeholders who are very, very powerful who aren't happy about that.